Welcome to Resource on the Go, a podcast from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center on understanding, responding to, and preventing sexual abuse and assault. My name is Louis Marvin, and I am the training specialist at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. This podcast is part of our Male Survivors series. Today, Vanessa Sapien joins me to talk about using an empowerment model in working with male survivors in detention. Vanessa is the Mental Health Program Director at Just Detention International, also known as JDI. Vanessa, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Could you introduce yourself and um, and a little bit about your work with JDI? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, you know, as you said, I, I am JDI's mental health program director, and I've been working there for going on four years now. Um, but prior to joining JDI, I spent 15 years working in the rape crisis uh, DV movement. Um, and so I had worked with rape crisis centers for about 15 years. Um, And I started out first as an advocate. So doing all the things that advocates do in terms of hospital accompaniments, accompaniments to law enforcement, um, and then transitioned to then working for the rape crisis center as a clinician once I uh, finished my graduate studies. Um, And then what led me to to JDI was actually you know, like I said, I had done this for about 10 to 15 years and really was kind of feeling like, what else is there to know? You know, I've done this for a long time. Um, I've been serving survivors for 15 years. And what was interesting was when I graduated from grad school, I was thinking about what I wanted to do and what population I wanted to work with. And oddly enough, you know, DV and SA were kind of not really on my radar because I had been doing it for so long already. But then I got a call from my former supervisor who said, you know, I know you just graduated and I know that you're kind of thinking through your options. And and intuitively, she said, this may not be something that you want to do, but hear me out first. And she then she mentioned Priya. And so that was the first time I had ever actually heard of the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And she went on to just explain, you know, kind of in more detail what it was and how long it had been around. And that was the part that really kind of hit me in the gut, that it had been around the entire time I had been an advocate. Here I was 15 years later hearing about it for the very first time. And so then that kind of set me on this trajectory of realizing that if I, as this sort of seasoned advocate, am hearing about Korea and what it means to serve incarcerated survivors for the first time, that I probably am not alone. Um, And so then that's what kind of led me to my work at JDI to then focus specifically and exclusively on supporting incarcerated survivors. And so um, as a mental health professional, I have worked with individual survivors in detention, as well as in um, various types of group capacities, um, facilitating art workshops or, um, you know, sort of community engagement events through our wellness series um, to then supporting pre-appear educators on the inside who are actually delivering Korea education to their peers. Um, and so, yeah, it, it been able to really support people in, in kind of a variety of different ways and, and indirectly sort of in a remote capacity, I also help provide uh, supervision and oversight for our support line for incarcerated survivors out of state that JDI uh, runs it overseas. So it's um, a lot of really great work and I absolutely love doing it. That's great. Yes. Thank you for sharing about your background and and JDI's work. Um, I know JDI does just really great stuff. And um, I've certainly looked to JDI's resources um, in in providing technical assistance in my own work. And um, uh, what I love about the conversation that we are having today is that you were so excited about talking about an empowerment model. And I think that that is a word that when I hear empowerment, um, you know, I've, obviously I feel like, yeah, that's a great word. Let's let's do empowerment. Um, but it also strikes me as just really at odds with a detention setting, perhaps. So, um, so yeah, I think that's really uh, great that you have some... Um, kind of key elements to review with our listeners um, about an empowerment model, and hopefully they can take a lot of um, of what you're sharing and um, 
put it into place to reach male survivors in detention in in their own communities. So um, I know that you really wanted to um, talk about healing from trauma and the different elements of it that um, that need to be in place in order for there to be uh, this empowerment model to reach male survivors in um, in in a detention setting. So what are some of those elements, Vanessa? (laughs) Yeah, so this is a a really important topic to me, probably one of the most important things that that I could be talking about. Um, And I think when it comes to empowerment and sort of the different empowerment models that that are out there, this is one that was introduced to me about 10 years ago. Um, and, and it really just sort of rang true with me and, and resonated with me. And so I think that whenever um, we are in process of sort of developing a new direct service program, or even in our pre-existing work, the work that we're doing now, this is sort of how measure everything um, and, and making sure that these components exist in everything that we do. And I think um, if if any of these components are missing, then we need to kind of reassess and, and take a look and making sure that we are delivering something as effectively and inclusively as possible. And so um, it all starts with, um, first and foremost, is it self-directed? And so what that means are, are all actions driven by the stated needs of survivors and not what they think they need. And so some examples of that include in in reporting, in disclosures, resources, and next steps, um, as well as sort of developing a plan for advocacy, so on and so forth. And so this is a really kind of key one for me because I think when we're working with survivors, and I think especially for those of us that are advocates that are, are really seasoned and have been doing this for a really long time, I think we can sort of fall into this habit of, okay, I've been working with survivors for X amount of years. I've seen it all. I've heard it all. And so I know kind of what a survivor might need, or I have an idea of what um, a survivor might benefit from. And I think when we think about empowerment, this is a really great way to kind of hold ourselves accountable as advocates as well, um, to make sure that we're constantly staying keyed into what the survivor is saying that they need. And I think this is especially important when we're working on the inside and we're working in a detention setting because we're talking about a community and an environment that we tend to know very, very little about. Um, And even for myself, you know, somebody who does spend a lot of time inside of facilities um, and, and in detention centers, even myself having the humility of knowing that even though I've spent time in a facility before, that doesn't mean that I understand it all what the culture and the community of another facility is like in a different state or even in the same state, you know? Um, So always really making sure that we're paying attention to the stated needs of the survivor and not what we think they need. Um, I think that's really, really important in detention. Um, And so the second one is around hope. And so offering honest and truthful hope that's rooted in reality and not what we would like to see happen. And so that's really key and and a really difficult one to kind of navigate because I feel like when we're talking to survivors and I think especially survivors in detention, you know, it can really not even feel, but be a really kind of hopeless, sad, depressive, oppressive environment. And of course, our natural inclination is gonna wanna be to offer hope. But we wanna make sure that we're not offering false hope and that we're offering hope that's rooted in the facts that are presented to us. And so an example of that could be something around saying, you know, well, you know, if you go and you talk to this officer, or if you go and talk to mental health, you know, I think you'll feel a lot better, you know, go to mental health, go and speak to them, set up an appointment and, and, you know, making all of those referrals that we're trained to make, right. Is like, of course, I'm going to want to send this person to mental health. Of course, I'm going to want to send this person to speak to a counselor, but that looks really different in detention. Um, So when we're talking about mental health on the inside, what we could be referring somebody to is a 15 minute assessment appointment and that's it because mental health services on the inside look very different than they do on the outside. So as much as we are wanting to be hopeful and helpful, we also want to be very realistic in our referrals and the way that we're offering um, support to, to folks on the inside. And so where an adjustment could be made could be in saying something like, look, 
I think that you can go and talk to a mental health professional and you know, just as well as I do, that when you go and see them, these might be some of the questions that you're going to um, be asked. They may not be directly related to what it is that you want to go in there and talk to this person about, but what are some ways that we can communicate our needs to that person, given the limited amount of time that we have? So talking them through and kind of coaching them through what to expect um, is, is kind of a way to sort of pivot, right, and, and, be, and be hopeful. Um, but sometimes that means having to um, put some of the responsibility in their hands and empower them and, and be hopeful in how they're able to deliver that. Um, so it can feel not so great to have to um, put so much responsibility on, on a survivor um, but I think if you can empower them and offer them hope in their own internal abilities to do that, um, that you're really kind of better serving them than offering a false sense of hope. Um, and so I think some other things around hope is that the primary goal, and this is another one that can be really difficult to kind of wrestle with, is I think the primary goal is never to make someone, quote unquote, feel better, especially if it is more self-serving than it is helpful. Um, I think male survivors prefer attainability and realism rather than feeling better. And so I think what we hear a lot of the times when we're working with male survivors is like, that all sounds good and great and everything, but that doesn't do me any good. You know, those just sound like, like really happy, positive words, but that, that doesn't do anything for me right now. And that's a fair point. You know, I think so. I think a lot of us maybe have, you know, kind of fallbacks or, or kind of go-to phrases that we use um, that sound really nice and, and, you know, maybe tend to work and, and do have a high degree of success. Um, but I think, again, really wanting to be rooted in, in the reality and, and understanding the culture and the community of the folks that you're serving that are on the inside and making sure that hope is, is realistic and, and rooted in, in reality and what's true and not what we would like to be true. Um, because as much as the are hopeful that the environment will change or that the detention setting will will change. Um, a lot of other things have to happen, but before that becomes a reality. I think that's really great. And you, yeah, you mentioned that sometimes it can feel bad to put responsibility um, yeah. on someone else, but in fact, responsibility is another one of the key elements of um, empowerment as you yeah. um, as you are offering it up. So talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, about why even though it might feel um, negative or counterintuitive, um, why why that's really important too. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think what this all boils down to is like you said, it's, it's responsibility. And so that is is definitely a part of the empowerment model. And it's one of the most important aspects of it, which is that survivors should have ownership and take accountability for their own healing um, as much as possible. Because having a sense of ownership in your in your healing is so important. I think what what's worse is to constantly feel like life is happening to you and that there's nothing that you can do. Um, and it's much more empowering to focus on what control you have, um, what choices and options you do have available to you, however small they may seem. You know, that's always the place to start. The place to start is always in things that we can control, especially if you are a survivor of a situation in which you felt like you had very little control. Um, and so that that absolutely works in detention where um, the, it's, it's an environment where you control almost nothing. You know, you can't control what time you go to bed. You can't control what time you wake up. You can't control what time you have dinner. Um, you can't control what time you shower or use the phone or are able to go outside. I mean, there's so very little choice. Um, and so I think to help someone in detention kind of navigate through the idea of choice and the concept of choice again um, as someone on the inside is a really important conversation to have, but it can also be a really difficult one. Um, and, but, it, but it's absolutely necessary. Um, and I think control and responsibility, like you said, are, are just key concepts, especially with, with men, you know, um, that, that really kind of resonate um, with male survivors is when you're able to have healthy conversations around control and responsibility. Great. So um, you've offered up um, self-directed as an important element, hope and responsibility. Um, I know that we've talked about how respect is important, right, for any survivor. Um, and but what can that 
in what ways can that be specifically important to male survivors who are in a detention setting? So in detention, I, I think respect becomes even more important because we're talking about an environment where um, earning someone's respect is, is key um, and respect in general in detention is key. Um, and it's sort of one of the rules that you live by um, that you all have to respect each other and respect each other's boundaries and um, you know, there are definitely um, hierarchies that can exist in detention. Um, there are, of course, a lot of rules and regulations and things that need to be followed. And so you just see this idea and this concept of respect come up all the time. And I think also, you know, when we're talking about detention and disproportionate numbers of people of color in detention, um, you know, I know from the environment that I grew up in versus the environment I went to school in that had a lot more resources and um, was much more affluent than where I grew up um, and even still currently live, you know, the idea of respecting communities of color is, is really important and looks differently. Um, and I think all of that is carried into detention as well, is showing respect for your elders, showing respect for people that you view as being leaders. Um, and so, with respect being so important for male survivors, giving and gaining respect and having a relationship based on reciprocity is also really important. And so you're going to be, as, as an advocate, you may find yourself really being sort of tested um, by male survivors. Um, you may be tested in your ability to be consistent. Um, you may be tested in your ability to not make false promises, because I think that's the other thing that goes back to that idea of hope, right, is that sometimes we may find ourselves unintentionally making promises we didn't intend to make. Um, and sometimes even phrasing things in a way that to someone on the inside may sound like a promise when that's not what you intended. So I think as much as possible, always saying things like, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to tell you anything that isn't true. I don't want to make any promises that I can't keep. But right now, this seems to be what we know, or this seems to be what the situation is. And so just being really mindful and careful of how you phrase things. Um, and so I think respecting a survivor's choices, as well as their decisions, because I think when you work with folks on the inside, and I think especially with male survivors, um, folks on the inside are going to make choices and decisions that we don't always understand and that we don't always agree with um, for the sake of survival. And we have to make peace with the fact that we have to then respect those choices and the decisions that folks are making and that they are doing what is right for them in the moment. Um, and that is really, really key. And that we're not um, creating situations where we're going to be in conflict with that. Because I think the second a survivor senses that you're creating a conflict with those choices and those decisions, you're then sort of breaking off those lines of communication and shutting them out. Um, so really just wanting to be open and non-judgmental and that meeting people where they're at, like we do with any survivor, you know, in the community or on the inside, we always want to meet folks where they're at. And then just understanding what dynamics of respect are important to the survivor. So again, going back to those cultural considerations of men of color, what does respect mean to that person? You know, So for one person, respect may look one way and for someone else, respect may look like something else. And so I think when you um, are working with folks on the inside, especially with men, and you find that you're kind of not getting somewhere or that communication isn't as strong as, as you feel like it should be, or that you're just kind of not connecting, um, to, to call that out and explore that a little bit more, you know, and I've certainly been in that situation or in that position where I feel like I am giving absolutely everything I can. I'm using all the tools in my toolkit. I'm throwing everything at a survivor and it's just not landing. And so then to just have the humility and say, look, this feels like it's not working. Can you help me understand what's going on? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I, you know, I'm having a hard time understanding, you know, what it is that, that you're needing right now. And sometimes they may not even know, but that's the place to start is I don't know. Um, and sometimes you just build from, from nothing um, and that's okay. And that's a perfectly good place to start. Um, and so I think the more that you can 
have humility and, and admit when you don't know something is, is really, really important. Because I think, again, when you're talking to somebody on the inside, they're not expecting you to know, they're not expecting you to understand. And so the more that you can just admit to that and, and, and not pretend and not feel like you have to overcompensate, um, the, the better it'll be for, for everyone. Um, so yeah, I think that respect is huge for many, many reasons. Thanks, Vanessa. I know that, um, there is this aspect of peer support that's really important when we're talking about an empowerment model. So what does peer support look like for, um, for male survivors who are incarcerated? Yeah. So I think with men, what we see a lot is that men typically will follow suit with what others are doing around them. So again, just sort of looking for like being really observant of, of the modeling that's going on around them. And so, um, you know, who are the men in this facility that are surviving and thriving and what to do to be like that and behave like that. Um, and so again, it's not to say that that women don't do that as well, but I think we just see that present more in, in men's facilities of just sort of mimicking behaviors um, and, and maybe even performing masculinity at times and, and what, that, what that looks like in that particular facility or, or means to them. And so the greatest network um, of support a survivor has is, is peer support. And so I think what we've seen and what we've, you know, kind of strived to create is this idea of sort of like this mentorship mentality. And so I think everybody is looking for opportunities to be of service, including folks on the inside. And so if we're talking about sexual abuse and detention as being a national problem, no one is more aware of that than folks on the inside who are experiencing and witnessing it firsthand. And no one knows better how to address it and how to support people than folks that are actually living in that environment. So as much as we are able to help as outsiders, and we certainly do play a pivotal role and can do a lot of great work, no one can do greater work than folks on the inside who can help each other. And so I think really kind of helping people explore ways in which they can be mentors to each other, create a sense of brotherhood, which is already really strong in detention to begin with. So why not capitalize on that concept and kind of turn it on its head and do something positive with it? Um, and also just the sense of loyalty, which is also really strong in prison, right? Like, so we see a lot of men who can be almost kind of loyal to a fault, but if we can start to plant seeds of how to use those norms and, and create something positive out of it, I think all the better. And we've seen a lot of success with that where folks will call in to our hotline or will, you know, be speaking to folks on the inside who say, hey, you know, I've experienced this, but I also know 15 other guys who've experienced it too. And no one wants to come forward. No one wants to talk about it. You know, so not only do I need help for myself, but then how do I help my guys? You know, how do I help the fellas? also who are just not willing to come forward and talk about it. Like, what could I do? Um, Cause they're my brothers, they're my family, you know, and, and I care about them. And so to be ready to then kind of help and support that survivor in helping their community at large. And then we see over time that, you know, those guys that, that he helped call our hotline or those guys that he spoke to then want to participate in programs. And, and that's how you create kind of greater ripples of, of change that are much more sustainable um, and then are helpful to us as advocates who want to go in and do other types of work. You know, those are the guys that are the people that you want to kind of stay connected to. And eventually those are going to be your program participants. Yeah. I love, um, I love the way that you are saying that um, um, like observing the lo the value of loyalty um, through a lens of how that can be empowering for a survivor and the community of survivors around him in this case. Um, so I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I, it strikes me that what you're doing when you're articulating that is viewing loyalty in a strengths based way, which is another characteristic of, um, an empowerment model program. So, um, so talk more about, um, you know, you just showed us um, an example of being strengths-based in how you were thinking about um, loyalty, but what is what is so important about um, a strengths-based approach to this model? Yeah, so I think when you're thinking about how to be strengths, uh, I always struggle with saying that, and you said it <laughs> well, strength-based, um, 
what resources and um, experiences does a person have um, that they can draw from? And so I think this becomes really important when we're talking about sort of self-care and coping skill strategies is um, to make them as strength-based as possible. So I think, again, as advocates, I'm sure all of us out there have sort of tools that we draw from and kind of have go-to strategies um, that we impart on survivors. And what we've noticed a lot of the time is that a lot of our self-care strategies and coping skills that we're offering up to survivors in the free world, um, meaning folks that are not on the inside, don't necessarily work for folks in detention. So a really good example of that is taking a therapeutic walk. You may not be able to do that in detention. Um, finding a quiet place to reflect or, or do whatever. You may not be able to do that in detention. Um, you know, taking the time to eat foods that you enjoy. You may not be able to do that in detention. So a lot of sort of these basic strategies that we have are not available in detention. I mean, we're talking just very, very basic things. And so I think this is where we have to be collaborative in the way that we think about self-care and coping and that it really does have to be a collaborative effort with the advocate as well as the survivor kind of coming up with things together. Um, and so one kind of unique example around that is just something that is seemingly so simple as journaling. Um, that's something that I encourage people to do all the time. But then you have to take that extra step of talking through, okay, is journaling safe for you? You know, is there someone in your cell who um, is going to make you feel bad about that or is going to give you a hard time if they see you journaling? Um, is there a safe place for you to keep your journal? Um, should you get rid of the pages as soon as you write in them? You know, are these things that you should tear up and then throw in the trash can because someone might come and search your room and find it? And are you going to be okay with someone reading it? Um, so again, it's sort of taking things to the next level. And I think anytime you're um, prepared to offer up a self-care self -care strategy or a coping skill to really think through, does this actually work for the survivor? Because again, something that seemingly is typically very safe as journaling now has all these other layers to it and all these other considerations that we don't typically have to make with folks that are not on the inside. Um, so that's what we mean by, by, by strength base as just sort of a simple example. And I think even... Um, sometimes as simple as just not knowing. I think sometimes even just like exploring when we're talking about internal resources and, um, and wanting to get sort of feelings focused with things. Um, I think a lot of survivors on the inside have such a poor self-concept, um, feel really hopeless about their abilities to to grow as a person and be the type of man or woman that they want to be. And I think in this case, the type of man that they want to be and feeling really restricted by the environment that they're in um, to really explore that. But I think sometimes just starting with what type of man do you not want to be? You know, even if that's all that you know, if all that you know is the type of man you don't want to be, then you actually know more about the type of man you want to be than you think you do. Um, and I think for a lot of men that I speak to, um, and that JDI has interacted with is they're coming from environments or situations where there wasn't a male in the home or they didn't have a lot of positive role models around them um, or that they were surrounded by males who, again, like we've talked about before around like toxic masculinity or um, men that are having to do things out of survival that may be um, or what landed them in, in, in detention in the first place, you know? So all these, these different things. And so then you come into detention and you're faced with those same circumstances of not really having anyone to turn to who is a positive model for you on what it means to be a man. And so I think that can be one of the, the, the questions to throw out there is like, well, it sounds like you know what type of man you, you don't wanna be. Um, and that I think the final thing with being strength-based is just, this recognition of that folks have what they need to heal and to survive. Um, and I think that's really key. I think especially on the inside, when we're talking about incarcerated survivors, we're talking about people 
who have sort of off the charts elevated survival instincts and skills that we just don't have. And so to really kind of focus in on that as a strength and explore with incarcerated male survivors what it means to survive and what skills they've developed over time, what strategies they've had to employ um, over time and, and working from there. Great. Um, Vanessa, you've get, you, you're giving us so many different um, elements. We're at, just, just to keep track, we're at self-directed. Um, an empowerment program is self-directed. It offers hope. Um, it incorporates responsibility, respect, peer support. It's strength-based. Um, what are some of the what are some of the final um, elements that you um, want to share with advocates about an empowerment model and um, how it relates to working with male survivors who are incarcerated? So I think the the next one is that this is not linear. So healing doesn't exist in a straight line, and I think a lot of us know that. But also that men may respond better to to steps. So step one, step two, after you do this, then this is to follow. Um, But that doesn't always necessarily work in detention. And so I think when we, you know, I'm I'm thinking back to to my advocacy days when I was an advocate at the Rape Crisis Center and I would respond to a hospital um, and I would review with the survivor, this is what's to follow. This is what you can expect after this. And, you know, then when this happens, then you can move forward with this step and you can call this person. And so I had my speech down, you know what I mean? I knew exactly what I was going to tell every survivor because that typically didn't change. Um, That's not true in detention. In detention, processes and procedures can be all over the place. Um, And so what you're told is supposed to happen, what you're told is going to happen in execution almost is never what actually happens. And so I think helping folks understand that um, and and understanding how that then influences and impacts the healing process. Um, And so understanding that as much as we would like to deliver sort of a step-by-step on what to do after an assault or what the steps might be to healing, that isn't necessarily something that's gonna be uh, available to us or afforded to us when we're working with folks on the inside. And so, it then becomes a conversation or a question of um, having to discuss what it means to be flexible, um, even when you shouldn't have to be, um, and how to cope with that. Um, and so to have that really difficult conversation. Um, and, and how then do we um, advocate for ourselves? So again, going back to some of the other key components that we were talking about earlier, is then having conversations with, with survivors around when things are not going your way, when processes and procedures are not going according to plan or according to the way you were told they were going to go, how do we then advocate for ourselves and ask questions in the right way so that we can kind of elicit the responses that we're looking for? Um, Because again, I think one of the, the really difficult and challenging things about working with folks on the inside is that we wanna make sure that we're trying to set them up for success as much as possible. And um, unfortunately, it, it, it often kind of boils down to having to explore communication styles on the part of the survivor um, and, and having to have those really difficult conversations of like when you're met this way or you're approached this way by this person and it shouldn't happen that way, how are you then gonna respond and keep your cool so that the next thing can happen and we can continue to move things forward. And, and it's, it's a really difficult conversation to have, but, um, but, and then, you know, so then what are the consequences of that? Right. So, um, you know, how does that then re-trigger a survivor when things are, are out of sequence and when things are, are not going according to plan or the way that they were told they would go, you know, understanding as an advocate that that in and of itself can be a really triggering experience. And so kind of being prepared as the advocate to then help the survivor kind of navigate through through that difficult and, and challenging aspect of, of all of this when we're talking about folks on the inside. Vanessa, I know that there's also this element of empowerment that has to do with um, healing that focuses on the whole person. Um, so the importance of being holistic, um, including one's identity as, as a man, and then also... Um, um, being individualized. So it's kind of like 
I don't know, maybe those aren't opposites, but those are kind of two different things. Um, so um, thinking about um, male survivors who are incarcerated, what are some considerations for making sure that um, your work is um, is addressing holistic healing needs and also are in, is individualized? Yeah, so I think um, the word holistic is, is really key here because if being holistic means focusing on the entire person as a whole, that's especially important when we're talking about folks on the inside. Um, because when you're in detention, you're typically only seen as an inmate um, or as a prisoner or whatever term they use in whatever state you're in. And if you notice, I think you and I, Louie, have done a really great job throughout this entire podcast of referring to folks on the inside as people. And that isn't typical um, of, of doing this type of work. Normally we are, you know, and you and I've had conversations or, you know, you, you and I had a conversation earlier about language and communication. And I think that that's really key, right? And so a big part of someone's identity on the inside is being viewed as just an inmate. And so other aspects of who they are as a person um, which includes all of us, right? Like all the aspects that make us human, all the things that that make us an entire person um, don't really exist in detention and, and aren't being offered um, in that way in any other aspect or in any other regard. So I think in our work, understanding that the work is not the same and the work does not change, that we are not talking to an inmate, we are not talking to a prisoner, we are not talking to even the incarcerated. We're talking to a person who happens to be in detention, very much like I am a person who happens to have a disability. We are not defined by our circumstances. We're not defined by where we live. We're not defined by who we look, what we look like. Um, and so I think in terms of being empowering in this sense, the fact that we are able to see past the fact that someone happens to be incarcerated and still focus in on all of those aspects that make us human, our relationships, our roles that we play. Um, and, you know, just because you're inside doesn't mean that you stop being a son or a father or an uncle or a nephew or a best friend. All of those things still exist in that person. And they, they don't just stop. Those, ro those roles don't just stop because you're inside, they, they continue to go on. And so I think that when we are supporting incarcerated survivors, um, we have to, to look at all of those things and we have to um, make sure that we're having those conversations and, and exploring all aspects of the person and not just the circumstances related to their incarceration. Uh, which can be really easy to do. And I think even challenging that a little bit, because I think sometimes I found myself talking to incarcerated survivors and that's all they focus on as well. Um, and so I think part of kind of shaking things up and, and getting outside of this detention mentality is to explore some of those things as long as it feels safe and comfortable um, to the survivor, you know, and I find that most of the time it is. It's like, you know, let's focus on your family and, and, and your kids and, you know, and on all of those kinds of things. And so I think when you're able to kind of get them out of that, I'm, I'm just inside and this is all I know, um, the, the better it is. Finally, I know that um, you were talking about how, um, how another key element in this direct service work with incarcerated male survivors um, is that healing involves um, a person-centered approach that's that's individualized to the survivor that you're working with which I mean I think that's something that advocates um, you know should should find familiar right that each survivor is their own is their own unique person and that healing is personal and looks different for everyone um, but what are some of the specific ways that um, the advocates should be uh, using that lesson in, um, in in a setting of detention and in working with male survivors who are in that setting yeah, so I think, you know, all the things that you just said, right, that each survivor is their own unique person, healing is personal, and, and it looks different for everyone, and of course, you know, what works for one male 
going to work for another. But I think even more than that is that no other relationship is more important than the one that you develop with the survivor. And so what we mean by that is that we can have a tendency to kind of over-involve ourselves in advocacy um, and developing relationships with other service providers. So I think, you know, as advocates, that's what we want to do, right, is we want to advocate. Um, and so we want to develop relationships with service providers and people that could potentially help. But then what ends up happening is that we're indulging um, in aspects or details that may not be salient for the survivor. And so these actions can actually pull us away from focusing on the survivor. And that that is, again, completely counter to, to what it is that we're there to do. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind is that when we're talking to folks on the inside or we're seeking to support folks on the inside, there can be this increased sense of urgency that comes up where you're seeing um, kind of the sort of the immediacy or the immediate need for something to happen. It's like, oh my gosh, the, you know, this person has, has nothing and these, you know, conditions are horrible. And I just, you know, and so when you're kind of doing this, this flustered thing and, and you're kind of just spiraling to figure out what to do, I think to center ourselves and remember that it's not about us and it's not about the things that we're freaking out about. It's not about the things that are making us uncomfortable. It's about staying connected to the survivor and what it is that they need. And that is one of the hardest things to do as an advocate, especially when you have a bleeding heart and you care so much. It's it's so easy to get caught up in all the things that are difficult about this environment and wanting to fix it all and, and, and make it all better. And at the end of the day, as much as that's great, and, and there are certainly um, a time and place for that, um, and then there could be space for that in our work, that at the end of the day, the most important thing is staying connected to the survivor and making sure that you are not exhausting precious time that you could be spending developing and deepening your relationship with them on other things that may not be as important to them, but are clearly important to you, um, if that makes sense. And, and, and that's, it's a really difficult, difficult balance, I think, especially if you're not used to, to doing this work and you're sort of discovering what it means to be in detention for the first time. Yeah, and I think what you described of trying to fix everything and you're, you know, going with your own, one's own feelings as an advocate about the detention setting is, is really putting yourself at the center of the experience. And that's really seems clear to me that that is not empowerment. So, um <laughs> Yeah. So, oh my gosh, Vanessa, you're offering up some um, some great tips, some great considerations for advocates to um, to incorporate into their work. Um, hopefully, a lot of it sounds familiar to people. Maybe some of it sounds new, or um, or maybe people have heard new ways that they can apply old lessons to a detention setting and working with male survivors there. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to say about about empowerment, including? Um, I know you mentioned at the very beginning that you and JDI sort of measure what you're doing against this model and say, is, are we living up to these um, these characteristics and, and to this model? Um, so, yeah, anything else that you can say about how you do that, how often you do that, um, how you go about making changes when you realize that you're not you're not meeting those goals? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, for JDI. Um, before we implement any sort of direct service, um, our first step is always to connect with the community directly as much as possible, whether it's in person, whether it's via survey, I mean, whatever means you're able to do that. And of course, you know, our recommendation would always be in person if that's possible, but that is always our first stop is to um, check in with the community, check in with the population, and ask them directly, like, hey, this is what we're thinking of doing. Does this work for you? Does that meet some needs um, that exist in this facility? And also, um, what would be your plan for executing X, Y, and Z service? And so I think as much as possible, when you're able to do that, then essentially you're setting yourself up for success, right? Rather than guessing how this might work or how this might be effective. And I think it's beyond also just meeting with with partners and meeting with administrators and meeting with staff you know you also want to meet with the community you want to meet with with the folks on the inside um and so 
in doing that, um, once you you sort of rolled everything out, I think, yeah, all the things that we've talked about, all these different considerations are things that you're always going to want to circle back to. Um, and at the end of the day, ask yourself the question, what does empowerment mean? And does it include the things that we've talked about? And, um, and also just thinking about what other cultures or communities um, do we make mistakes with in our attempts to empower? And so, you know, like I shared with you earlier, my background prior to coming to JDI and a big part of my life and my work now is being an activist for the special needs community and people living with disabilities. And I think, you know, this is certainly something that I've experienced as a person who identifies as having a disability is that, you know, there's this um, tendency to want to over help and overstep and, and, and over correct and do all of these things, right? It's like, I know what's best for you. And, you know, I don't have a disability, but I'm this executive director of this organization that is serving your community and I know what's best, you know? And so I think I carry that with me in the work that I do at JDI and working with incarcerated survivors is I'm working really hard to not make the same mistakes that I've experienced being made with me as a person with a disability and well-intentioned and well-meaning people wanting to help. And so I think as much as we can kind of think through some of those errors that we've made in our work currently, um, you can always apply that to any community that you're working with, right? And I feel like if we can reflect on some of those examples, those feel much more real, right? And, and we can all kind of draw from, from previous mistakes that we've made and making sure that we don't make those same mistakes with incarcerated survivors moving forward. And I think that if you can look through some of these considerations, if you can focus on being self-directed, if you can focus on hope, if you can focus on responsibility, respect, peer support, being strength-based, understanding that this is not linear, that we want to be holistic, that we want to be individualized and person-centered, then you are absolutely really kind of setting yourself up to being as empowering as you can possibly be as an advocate, which at the end of the day, I know is something that we all want. We're all here to empower and uplift each other and to uplift survivors. And so I think that, you know, this is, this is a good place to start. Vanessa, that is an amazing call to action um, to end on. Is there anything else you wanted to say um, as we're wrapping up? Um, you know, I think acknowledging the fact that, you know, in order to even do any of this work, that understanding that obviously rape crisis centers and advocates are going to have to develop partnerships and relationships with facilities, which again is kind of a completely separate podcast in and of itself, right? Uh, which, which I can appreciate that. But I think some key things to keep in mind as you're working to sort of build these relationships and these partnerships for the sake of incarcerated survivors so that you can do this work is just really wanting to identify who your key players are within a facility. And so for us, very often, it's the community resource manager who oversees programming in a facility. It could be, you know, the chief of mental health and whoever oversees mental health programs. So really not just focusing on, you know, folks at the very, very top, like a warden, but also working on kind of building relationships with key folks on the inside whose work, you know, it, it, it informs what you do and vice versa, right? So really wanting to kind of be plugged in to that. Um, and then I think also just always keeping in mind, always, always keeping in mind that you are a leader of language when you are talking to incarcerated survivors, when you're on site, um, even when you're talking to your team. You know, we've talked a lot about not using uh, the word inmate, not using the word prisoner, and, and just avoiding labeling people as much as possible. And I think especially, you know, within your agencies, um, really wanting to keep that in mind that, again, you're talking about a community of, of people no different than any other community. And so how would you go about doing that sensitively and making sure that, you know, um, that nothing changes in terms of when you're addressing folks who are on the inside. And I think um, as, a, as a crisis center, are your services inclusive? Um, and, and by inclusive, we mean, are you prepared to offer services to incarcerated survivors? Do you have procedures in place? Um, you know, do you have, have you kind of thought through what it might look like if you received a letter from someone on the inside and how you would respond? Um, have you trained your staff on what it means to, you know, be a survivor on the inside? And, you know, again, just to plug in JDI, that's certainly something that, that we can help with. And JDI, of course, has, 
you know, a plethora of resources on our website that we can support people with. And, you know, I appreciate Louie kind of mentioning some of those resources at, at the top of this podcast. Um, and then just really wanting to think through once you know all of those things, um, really kind of thinking through what some of the barriers are. And so again, this is not just folks on the inside, but also in reentry. So, you know, you could very well have survivors coming in who have inside and are now on the outside. And what are the barriers that incarcerated survivors who are now getting ready to be released might experience and gaining access to your organization or your agency? You know, are you kind of plugged into um, the various sort of systems in place um, where folks can, can, can know who you are and, and know about you, you know? And that could very well mean creating flyers and pamphlets and things that you can send to the inside so that folks know how to access you on the outside. Do they have access to your phone number? Do they have access to your address? And making sure that, that, it's, that you're not placing the responsibility on them to find you, but that it's our responsibility to find them. Um, and I think just, you know, to kind of round things out, um, just some sort of general tips and considerations um, that I think are helpful for anybody if you're going to work with folks on the inside or, or, you know, find yourself working with the detention facility is being aware of your own biases, um, of working with men, specifically men of color, and working with men on, on the inside. And I think, you know, we've talked a lot about humility and, and, um, and kind of checking ourselves and, and our own privileges and, you know, our own insecurities and so on and so forth. But I think being aware of our own biases and focus your efforts on trauma in general rather than on sexual abuse, I think is also really key for rape crisis centers out there and for advocates is that um, really figuring out how to talk about trauma in a general sense rather than being so focused on wanting to talk about sexual abuse and, and being very direct about calling it sexual abuse. There is a time and a place to, to name it for someone, but I think initially, even for a while, um, we might want to consider how to have conversations about sexual abuse where we're not directly talking about sexual abuse. And so um, really kind of rising to, to that challenge. And I think that the last two things is I think, remember that talking about trauma or showing emotion is not safe in detention and, and that this sentiment carries over even when someone is released. Um, so again, talking about reentry as well as when you're still on the inside is that talking about rape and trauma and sexual assault and sexual abuse is not safe in detention. And so that for all of us is gonna be one of our greatest barriers. And so we need to be prepared to be creative and sensitive to how we talk about it. And then just lastly, that male survivors are more concerned, um, tend to be more concerned about surviving in the present and not focusing on the past. And so really just kind of being solution focused and future focused in our work um, as much as possible and understanding that we may not have the luxury of being able to look to the past and look at, you know, how we got here. Vanessa, thank you so much for joining um, me and us again today. I think this was a great conversation and you're just offering up so much great stuff to advocates who, um, who are working with male survivors in detention, uh, whether they're just starting to do that or just approaching doing that or whether they um, have been doing it for a long time and want to uh, assess whether or not they um, are doing this work in an empowerment um, type of way. So thanks again. We invite listeners to learn more about working with male survivors and to learn more about JDI's work to uh, check out the links in the, um, the show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode of Resource on the Go. For more resources and information about understanding, responding to, and preventing sexual assault, visit our website at www.nsvrc.org. You can also get in touch with us by emailing resources at nsvrc.org.